For everybody online, thank you so much for joining us tonight for HMSC's Virtual Science on Tap. I know we're not all together in the Rogue or at the new Marine Studies building, but I hope you're somewhere comfortable with some good food and drink as you join us tonight. My name is Cinnamon Moffitt. I'm the Research Program Manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, located in Newport, Oregon, and I will be your host for this evening. This is a webinar format, so a little bit different than a Zoom meeting. Um, we have your mics, cameras, and screen shares turned off for this event, but we hope that you put lots of questions for our speaker tonight into the chat box, which you can find either at the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on what format you're using. Uh, feel free to put those questions in at any time throughout the talk so you don't forget them. Um, we'll probably get through them at the end of the talk unless there's something specific about a particular slide. Um, wanted to let you know that we will be recording today's event. So if you uh, want to share it with somebody else, or if you miss something and you want to watch it again, I just put that link into the chat box. One, so you can find the chat, and two, so you can see that link if you would like to. A um, couple of quick announcements before we get started. Uh, next month's Science on Tap will be March 16th. Peter Ruggiero, a professor with CIOS and uh, at OSU, and the director of the Cascadia Coastlines and People's Hazards Research Hub, that does not roll off my tongue easily, um, will be giving a talk about how Cascadia coastal communities can increase their resilience to coastal hazards. For those of you that know me, um, my other hat is an emergency manager, so I'm really excited for um, Peter to come and give us this talk. So that will be on March 16th. Um, I will also do a little plug for HMSC's Marine Science Day on April 9th. This event will again be virtual, so just save the date and keep an eye out as we start pushing out more information so that you know how to log on to that event. But if you need information, like I was just saying, about any of these events, uh, check out HMSC's homepage on what platform you use. Um, Google it, Firefox it, whatever it is, scroll to the bottom of that page and you will get uh, HMSC's homepage and there's a calendar of events there. If you go to that calendar of events, you'll get all the login details for all the events you might see and uh, want to join us for. But for tonight, which is why we're all here, uh, we're really excited to have Dr. Sue Spinagle here to talk to us about her work. But first, just a little bit of background about um, Dr. Spinagle. She is a professor in the Department of Integrative Biology at Oregon State University and co-leads the Plankton Ecology Lab at Hatfield Marine Science Center, where I'm located now. Uh, inspired to pursue marine science while growing up in Thailand, Sue has retained her love of tropical oceans by focusing much of her research on coral reef fishes. Sue completed her bachelor's at the University of Chicago and her graduate degrees at Stony Brook University. Nine years ago, Sue moved to OSU from the University of Miami, where she was a professor and departmental chair and editor of an international journal called the Bulletin of Marine Science. Today, she'll be sharing some of her lab's research in tropical and coastal organ waters as they examine the physical and biological processes leading to the successful population replenishment of nearshore fishes. We're excited to have uh, Dr. Spinagle here tonight. So Sue, it's yours. Go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you, Cinnamon. And you can hear me, I assume. And I'm going to assume that you all can hear me unless I get a message from Cinnamon that that's not the case. I'm happy to be here and thank you to all of you for joining in on this adventure as we go underwater and learn a little bit about uh, fishes. These fishes that are across the top here are actually tropical, but um, as you'll see, we'll talk about a number of different fishes. So we're gonna start off with the whole concept <clears throat> that marine fishes, be they tropical, be they temperate, all mostly, most of them have what we call a complex life cycle. And that's depicted here. Let me find my little arrow. This is my little arrow, by the way, it's off on the right side now. It's very little, but um, anyway, it's there. <laughs> Hopefully uh, highlighting some of where I'm trying to draw your attention. So this is the Boccaccio uh, rockfish along uh, this coast. And what we mean by complex life cycles is that different stages of the life history of an organism, in this case fishes, occupy different habitats. So in this case, we see that the adults down here in the right corner are living in deep water caves where they reproduce and they produce these rather transparent, wispy looking little things uh, that we call larvae. 
that then grow and develop and they grow into these pelagic juveniles that start um, associating with various drifting algae and so forth. As they progressively uh, grow some more, they then move down and what we term settle or enter that juvenile habitat. Um, and in this case, it's sort of this near shore, uh, much shallower habitat. There may be some grasses, there may be kelps, uh, rocks, et cetera. They grow a little bit more. They start moving out into some uh, boulder fields and then uh, completing the cycle, moving even deeper into those caves. So you can see then that it, when we start thinking about all these different stages, they're really living in a very different environment, um, feeding on different things um, and, and behaving differently. So um, this life cycle is for many marine fishes, again, be they tropical or temperate. So most of the questions that I'm going to be talking about today um, are questions we ask in a number of different oceans. Now, the portion of this life cycle that we are most interested in in the Plankton Ecology Lab is this one in red. And that's because, largely because of these little transparent things that are tiny and uh, widely distributed in a very vast ocean. It makes it very difficult to understand exactly what those stages are experiencing and how they're surviving. And uh, so that is largely our focus and, and will certainly be the focus today. Now, the other reason is that larvae are just cool. Um, no matter what the fish, in this case, a really large uh, marlin, they all start off really tiny. And some are tinier than others, granted, but in this case, I mean, who can resist this guy? This guy's super cute um, and obviously very, very small. Here's another uh, compilation, I guess, of um, larval fishes, mostly tropical in this case. Um, they vary immensely in how they look. Some of them have these long spines that probably reduce predation. Others have these dangling parts. Um, many of them are transparent. You can especially see that up at this eel, which looks like a ribbon. And this really sweet little mola mola or sunfish uh, looks just like you know a really fancy sparkling Christmas ornament. Um, but all of these, unlike what this compilation suggests, all of these fishes tend to be rather rare in the ocean. And as we all know, the ocean is huge. So again, it poses a problem in how do we go about uh, studying these fishes? So I'm gonna talk today about the tools that we use and tell you a few vignettes about, uh, that illustrate that. But I'll start by addressing you know, why. Why do we care other than the fact they're so cute? Um, and it's difficult to study them. Well, one of the main reasons is depicted here. And this is the plot, and it's just a completely made up plot. It doesn't, you know, it's grounded in reality, but it's a schematic diagram for, uh, to illustrate this. So most fishes produce, you know, lots and lots and lots and lots of eggs, thousands and thousands of eggs. And so we can think of, um, the numbers here is, let's say this is a hundred, this is all in a thousands, a hundred thousand eggs are produced when that young then are, are zero. So they're, they're just spawned. Um, and as they age, that number, which ages on the x-axis here, that number plummets. And it plummets because they are little, tiny, tasty morsels. And because they're so little, many, many predators can consume them and they're faced with the stresses of trying to find food themselves. And there is just a very high mortality rate. So we see this exponential decrease in numbers as they get, a, you know, they start reaching a size whereby um, they can evade predators or um, they, they get large enough that they don't fit in the mouths of a lot of predators, that mortality rate falls off and you get um, a lower reduction in numbers until you reach the point at which these larvae are returning to enter that population, or sometimes we use the term recruit into the population or settle into the population. I might use those somewhat interchangeably in this case. So one of the reasons that we study larval fishes is it takes just 
a small change up in this area when they're really, really young, that some sort of change that increases their growth rate, that, you know, and this could be temperature change, it could be in, in increased food, maybe the predators all disappear. A very small change leads to a very large difference by the time you translate that out to the end uh, where they're entering the population. And so that year class, when we think of, of replenishment of populations, again, we wanna try and understand what's happening up here so we can better understand these big differences we see at the end. So small differences in survivorship um, of, of these young stages can make a really large difference in how the population is replenished and then ultimately how that population enters the fishery. So fundamentally, we're interested in understanding how fish populations are replenished. So let's look again at the same um, life cycle. And again, the red arrow here is the part I'm going to be talking about today. Importantly, it's not it's not as simple as this schematic would, would indicate. It's not a little circle here and everybody's doing a little circle out in the ocean. In fact, these fish can spend weeks out at sea, sometimes even on different species, months, and get carried around a lot. So we're interested in that path that they take to return uh, to the juvenile habitat. But it's not simply a matter of connecting those dots and figuring out the currents and, and um, modeling it from that. But that during this time period, the, all these little larvae need to find food themselves and grow and develop, and they have to avoid being consumed by other organisms out there. And all of these components, the growth, the prey, the predators are all influenced by their environment. What sort of environmental conditions are they experiencing? What are, what's the abundance of food or prey that they're um, encountering? And uh, likewise, the abundance of predators. So this is the same uh, schematic in a slightly different way. We're going from the pelagic larvae. Pelagic just means out in the water column. These tiny larvae, and then they're settling out from that water column to the juvenile habitat. <clears throat> and in between here, the things that uh, contribute to the survivorship of these larvae and the successful return of these larvae are environmental conditions, prey, and predators. So today I'm going to um, talk about four primary tools that we use to explore this part of the life stage. And this is just an outline of those four tools. The first, when we're looking at um, examining these pelagic larvae, we undertake major research cruises on large vessels um, and sample with nets. I'm gonna talk about this particular net um, that we use, which is termed mock nests, and it allows us to discreetly sample different depths. As we move along here, of course, we must um, pay attention to these environmental conditions and the prey and predators. And for that, we use some state-of-the-art underwater imaging uh, system, um, which we term the ISIS. And finally, when we're getting down, ending near the end of this uh, pelagic portion of the life cycle, as uh, the juveniles are entering this in, uh, environment, often you know, more uh, near the bottom, um, we're interested in sampling these survivors. I've lost my little pointer. There we go. Uh, sampling the surviving larvae that have made it into shore. And uh, on this coast, we use uh, this near shore sampling device termed a smurf. We also dive and make hand collections as well. Now, for all of these techniques, basically A and C, where we end up with baby fish in our hands, we use a fourth tool and that is the otolith microstructure. And all fishes have what we call ear stones in their heads that help them with hearing and balance. Uh, but for us, these otoliths serve as little mini flight recorders. So I'll be going in a little bit more detail in all of these, uh, these four tools. So first off, let's start with sampling the larval fishes at sea again. We go out on these large vessels. You can see these often down at the docks in Newport. 
This particular net system that we use is called a multiple opening and closing net and environmental sampling system, which is of course a huge mouthful. So we just say Mock Ness. Plus it sounds sort of, you know, like a Loch Ness monster. Um, and we actually didn't name that ourselves. So this is a very large uh, system that you can see it's, this is it lying on, on the deck and this is sort of um, a view down while uh, folks are setting up these nets. And in fact, this particular one has two sets of nets, this larger net on the right, smaller on the left. And it's a little hard to understand exactly how that works. So this drawing down here um, illustrates that a bit better. It's a, there's a sequence, uh, a series of nets that basically are triggered from the ship. They're, they're you know, dragged through the water column. And as they're dragged through the water column, we can send a signal uh, through the wire that closes one net and opens the next. So we're able to do that at specific depths and therefore have this discrete uh, sampling and really know exactly where those uh, larval fish were coming from. Okay, now we want to look at what are those fish consuming and who's consuming them? Well, for many um, planktonic organisms, and this is depicted here um, for copepods, which are common prey of larval fishes, they occur in, in a rather patchy way. There's dense patches and uh, less dense patches. And you can imagine for a larval fish who's moving through this, if they are in the middle of a big patch of very dense prey, will make a big difference uh, relative to if they're way out here, say. Now, a traditional net, a plankton net, will come along and integrate all those, because you have to tow it through a, a, you know, a large portion of the water column, you're integrating all those different um, densities into one average density. And sometimes that makes it a little bit difficult to understand the relationship between what the fish are seeing and what the fish is doing, i.e. how it's growing. So we are interested in understanding the environment that the fish is experiencing from the fish's perspective. So on a scale that's important to that fish. And to do that, we add in this additional instrument termed the ISIS. And you can see this again right next to uh, the net system here. So ISIS stands for in situ ichthyoplankton imaging system. Uh, not the terrorist group, even though this does look rather menacing. Um, this is the unit right here. And if you take this unit and sort of uh, look at the cross section of it, you can see that's what the schematic is down here. And basically what this imaging system does as it's being towed, looking up in the right hand corner here, towed behind a ship, is that it images, it backlights um, the plankton as they're occurring naturally in the water and creates a shadow that's then captured by a camera. And that happens right here. A light is, is sent out from this LED here. It's focused by this lens into a mirror, which it sends that light across this undisturbed water between these two pods. This is the water that's imaged. As the plankton um, appear in here, there again, their shadow is captured. That shadow is um, bounced off of this mirror, focused again and captured by the camera. So as we're towing it through the water, it's generating this one really, really, really long uh, parcel uh, image, basically. And here is um, a quick, very quick video of the types of organisms that ISIS sees. In this case, the, the unit was um, deployed from the surface down to depth. Um, I think this was off of Monterey Bay. And all I want you to look at is just take in the zen a little bit of what you're seeing here, that it's basically not all the same from the surface to 130 meters or something like that. Um, okay, I'm gonna start it down here. So first we start, you can see a whole bunch of these little jellies or hydromedusae and a lot of other, you know, good sized specks in the background. Now those specks have all gotten smaller and the hydromedusae have disappeared and it hasn't even been that long. Now those specks are getting even smaller, one or two big things floating by. Um, but again, lots of change and just one uh, deployment, vertical deployment. Now there's 
you know, it's really getting down to very few organisms in the water. So that's one long image. How do we analyze that? Well, we break that image into uh, given segments. It's basically parsed. This is a, a flow chart. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about it, but it's basically a two-step process. You break the image and it, the image is segmented. And what that means is that um, in, in all these little regions of interest, the computer, um, we've designed the system to identify what the computer refers to as regions of interest. Um, these are all sliced out of uh, the main image and then they're classified. And this has been a very long process that involved many, many talented people. Um, and I'm not gonna go into any more of it now other than it takes a lot of computer processing. And if you want to know more, you need to talk to uh, Mo Schmidt here, uh, otherwise known as the, the blue man. So this is what we see. We see all sorts of cool things ranging from diatoms or you know, basically the plants that are, that are fueling the system to copepods, which our fish love, to these gelatinous looking organisms, uh, some of which prey on fishes. And then all the way up to our, uh, at least the focus of this particular talk, and that is uh, larval fishes. Okay, so now we've collected fish offshore, we've imaged their environment. Oh, I should have said both the net system as well as the imaging system all collect a lot of environmental information simultaneously. So we know a lot about what's happening offshore. For this third type of tool, we wanna to sample the survivors, the larvae that have made it, that have survived the time at sea and now are coming back near shore to uh, move into that sort of benthic juvenile stage. And for this, we collaborate with Dr. Kirsten Grohrud Culvert, um, the ODFNW Marine Reserve Program, Oregon Coast Aquarium, and the Port Orford Station. And all of this is led by our graduate students at different times, Danny Ottman, Will Fenny, Megan Wilson are the recent three. Uh, Danny's here holding. Uh, one of these units, so you can get a, a, you can sort of see how big it is. Of course, it doesn't usually have these little plastic uh, <laughs> smurfs in there, but um, instead, it's hopefully collecting these juveniles as they again venture into shore. The whole system is, I mean, the whole smurf is encompassed by this net underwater by these snorkelers. And here's Megan. Um, and then all the fish are removed and collected. And I should say all of these are, are deployed along the coast, both in reserves and outside of reserves, both north and south along the Oregon coast. And finally, our fourth tool here is a really valuable tool. And, and one of the reasons why we focus on fish because they have this, um, again, it's often handy to think of it as a flight recorder. We basically dissect the heads of these small um, fishes and remove the ear stones. These structures occur in the, the inner ear. Again, useful. There's a definite biological function, but for our purposes uh, here, if you take these ear stones and polish them or section them, you get something like this. <clears throat> and this is from a rockfish. And you can see immediately that this looks, it, it should probably remind you of an onion or you know, the cross section of a tree. But instead of, say for the, in the case of the tree, instead of each increment indicating a year, each of these increments represents one day of life. And so we can obtain a lot of information on an individual fish from this otolith. And this is just randomly placed here, but the distance between these neighboring increments gives us a measurement of larval growth for that day. We can also take that same type of measurement and measure it right out at the end here, take the average of the last two or three increments, and that's recent growth. That's the growth that this fish, this was how that fish was growing just before we collected it. And I'll be talking about this in the examples. The distance from the core out to any given point here is the relative size of that fish at 
a given point, you know, be it day, day 10, day 20, or um, size at settlement. And then we can also count the increments all the way out to, in this case, if it's a juvenile fish that's settled to the near shore, say a smurf fish, fish we've collected as it's come in to settle, we can actually uh, estimate the number of days that fish spent at sea. And that, you know, you might have heard of that as the pelagic larval duration. I'll be referring it to that here as age at settlement. But least I neglect, the most valuable of all our tools are our people. And uh, I, we all work as a team. Everybody in this picture contributes. Uh, some are a little hairier than others, but um, you know, it's, it's, it wouldn't happen without everybody pulling together and doing their, their portion of the work. For the vignettes part, for the tools part of this talk, I'm gonna be um, specifically giving examples from uh, work of five different graduate students, a couple of whom have moved on um, and uh, just highlighting a few stories that basically illustrate how those tools can come together. Okay, so here's the tails portion. Um, the five vignettes uh, that I decided to talk about today um, come from several different uh, oceans. We have one from the Straits of Florida, one from the Gulf of Mexico, and three, because this is an Oregon audience, out here uh, in the Northern California uh, current. Okay, so the first one by Miriam Gleiber is tuna uh, focused in the Straits of Florida. So, um, I'm just going to give you, um, after the oil spill, I'm sure you all know how the currents flow, but basically what happens here is the currents flow down out of the Gulf of Mexico and around the Florida Peninsula and up and become the Gulf Stream. So this is a very uh, strong western boundary current, and it creates in this very narrow area here a lot of dynamic oceanography. So this was a project that we undertook to basically better understand and quantify patchiness in the plankton and how that might influence growth of fishes and, and other organisms. For Miram's, uh, one of her chapters, she focused on the black fin tuna, which is uh, recreationally harvested in Florida, but we don't know a whole lot about its uh, population dynamics as no, no um, stock assessment has been done. So these are some of the uh, stations, or well, all of the stations that we sampled each of two years, 2014 and 2015, where we deployed um, both the mock nest, the net sampling system, and the imaging system um, in the same, at the same station, same uh, body of water. Okay, so here is what, when Miram was all said and done with sorting the samples and identifying everything, in 2014, um, these circles here indicate the relative density of the larval fishes. And you can see that uh, there are quite a few of them here compared to the same time of year, June also in 2015, and much smaller circles here. Now they're color coded this way because to basically reflect the temperature that was recorded during this time period. There was a significant temperature difference with uh, the 2015 fish living in much warmer water. Now Mir me measured uh, the, the tuna in this case and found that um, all of the fish, that in general, those fish that occurred in 2014 were larger. And by looking at their otolith, she was also able to determine their age and she found out that they were also older. Now you factor in length and age and you get an estimate of growth rate in this case. And she was able to uh, determine that um, these fish in 2014 were growing significantly faster than the ones in 2015. She then asked the question, why? Why might they be growing uh, faster and explore their gut contents? Now this little inset here is simply the amount of stuff, the amount of um, consumption uh, that's happened that was in the gut. So just the total biomass and it's adjusted for size of fish, of course. Um, 
And you can see that the fish basically had a lot more in their uh, guts in 2014 than they did in 2015. Not only did they have more stuff, more biomass, but the, the um, composition of the prey also varied. In 2014, there were a lot more calanoid copepods and forannula copepods and other copepods, whereas in 2015, there were a lot more nauplii. Nauplii are an earlier uh, crustacean stage. I, <laughs> I like to think of them as those really spiky burrs that you step on around Hatfield, but um, you know, kind of spiky and not very nutritious. So they're eating very different stuff and filling up their guts in a very different way. Now, Miriam was able to use the ISIS data, the imaging data, to then examine the distribution of those um, copepods in the water column. And that's indicated down here on the bottom, the environmental calanoid density from low to high, and then the same biomass right here um, from low to high at all the different stations in each year. Again, color-coded by 2015 in red, 2014 in blue. And you can see that wherever there were more calanoid copepods in the environment, there were more in the guts. And uh, you know that was primarily, and they're um, completely separated by year. These small numbers were all 2015 and the large numbers all 2014. So just a, a quick, Fun schematic uh, for this uh, little vignette here. Two different years, a cooler year, a warmer year. The cooler year with more um, copepod prey, the warmer year with more nauplii prey. Tuna larvae varying quite a bit in their size and in their growth rates, much faster growth rate in 2014. You can see that here where growth is increasing until it reaches a given temperature as temperatures across the bottom here when it starts to decrease again all of that is in 2015. These different environments were reflected in what they ate and their gut contents. And the, the overall result being that there were 10 times more fish in 2014 and those fish were faster growing um, than there were in 2015. Okay, tail number two. Now we're moving to the Gulf of Mexico for Keely Axler's uh, master's work, where she, um, where we, we conducted a number of, this was a big collaborative study, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, whereby uh, net samples were collected right at the mouth here of Mobile Bay. And uh, the imaging system was also towed across this area. Basically, you can divide because we're talking about, in this case, fresh water exiting Mobile Bay and mixing into this more saline water. We can think about um, the water coming out of Mobile Bay as forming this plume of fresh water and versus the shelf, which is the other areas along here not as influenced. Oh, and there goes my monitor. Let me just... Okay, everybody, Sue's having a little trouble with her internet. She's going to be back soon, I promise. Um, but if you have any okay. questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Sue, are you back? I am back. I don't know if you can see me or not, but hopefully- We, we have lost side. your video, but we can hear your voice. Okay, sorry about that. This is part of the drama of doing this at home. <laughs> You're okay. Okay, so let's see here. So, hold the um, plume as it was coming out of Mobile Bay, as well as the shelf waters to either side of Mobile Bay. Okay, now my, oh my God. computer's doing all sorts of fun things. So Keeley focused on two of the most abundant species out there, the striped anchovy, and that's in the top two plots here, and the sand sea trout, which are the bottom two. On the left are the sizes. Yeah. We're unable to see your plots. We're still seeing um, the shelf <laughs> plume map. How interesting is this? Okay, hang on. I'm going to just undo my monitor for a second. Thank you. I don't know why. I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Still the same? Yep. Hmm. Okay, then. We can see your mouse. Yeah, I'm going to just stop sharing for a minute. Yep. And then share again. See if that reboots everything. Sounds good. Yep, that I can see now. Okay. Okay, then. Thank you, Cinnamon. And let okay. me know if the next little animation doesn't work. So, um, top two plots, striped anchovy. Bottom two is sand sea trout. Basically, very simply here, what you see, shelf waters in the purple, plume water, the more um, fresh water in the green, is that fish were on the shelf for both species. They were larger and they were older in general. Can you see that, Cinnamon? The next animation? Yes, we can see that. Okay, we're back in business. <laughs> um, so this is the bottom two plots here, our recent growth. And that, so that's how the fish were growing just before they were collected by the system. And you can see that um, the fish that were on the shelf in the salt water were growing significantly faster than those in the fresh water. So this is all uh, captured right here where the fish on the shelf are larger, older, higher condition. I didn't show you that, but they were and growing more rapidly. So why was this? Okay, so now we're gonna look at those ISIS data to see what does the prey environment look like? So in this case, the imaging system was um, sampling on this transect back and forth for three days. And those three days are depicted here on the right. The low salinity, that fresh water is, is not as dense as seawater, so it floats on top as it's coming out. We're looking basically right at the bay, right into the screen here, basically, as you're looking right into Mobile Bay. So you can see this fresh water floating out over top of this uh, denser salt water. Then the next day, there was a flushing event. So a lot of rain and you know, moving that, that uh, fresh water offshore even more. So you see a larger proportion of that water column is, is fresher and even more the following day. So Keeley counted up all those calanoid copepods in the plume versus the shelf and in fact found that there were significantly more copepods these tasty prey items in that fresh water as opposed to the shelf. But that's puzzling because she found that the growth of these fish was, at, was much higher in the shelf environment. So what is going on? So she hypothesized that, um, that it was in fact due to the turbulence, of the, you know, this water moving out as well as turbidity. This is an example of just one single image from the imaging system, plume water versus shelf water during the daytime. And you can see there's a huge, huge difference that all this sediment and muck in the water makes to potentially how a larval fish will be able to find its prey and capture its prey. So the hypothesis is that even though there are many more prey items in the plume, it's actually harder for the fish to capture them. Okay, third tail. We're now moving over to the coast we know and love off the Oregon coast here in the Northern California Current. This is part of the Mezcal project that uh, we ran. Um, and you can see that uh, we are no longer in the tropics here. And um, these great photos by Mark Farley really, I think, capture some of the drama on shore. And, and just as a um, to demonstrate, I guess, illustrate how um, large the net system is. Look at the number of people in the lower right corner here. One, two, three, four, five, I don't even know how many here, pushing the net system off to start sampling. That's how large it is. So designed again to sample these rather rare uh, larval fishes. Okay, so this first, uh, this next um, vignette is Kelly Swika's work. And she, uh, um, for this chapter of her dissertation, has been focused on lanternfish. 
And uh, you can see with this middle picture here why they're called lanternfish is they have these little glow in the dark decorations all over their bodies. Uh, they occur rather deep in the ocean. And uh, this is a handy way to communicate when there's not much light. So her um, focal species here is the northern lampfish, which is really widely distributed along the coast, uh, all the way from Baja, California to the Bering Sea, and is very abundant. This fish, as an adult, is um, small-bodied and rather short-lived, and as such really functions well as a forage fish. And what I mean by that is that it's providing food for other fishes and other organisms in the California current, um, plays a really important role in the food webs that we have out here. So um, we conducted a series of major cruises again off the coast here, off um, Oregon and Northern California in both winter and summer. So what's depicted here is the top two are 2018. Winter is in this greeny blue color and summer, just think of it as warmer, in the gold color. And the NH line is at the top here and uh, Trinidad headline in Northern um, California is um, at the bottom of each panel here. So winter, in summer of 2018, winter and summer of 2019. And these little uh, circles here indicate the abundance of the northern lampfish. And you can see that in general, um, you know, it's, qu it's quite abundant uh, all seasons and in all locations. So Kelsey spent a fair bit of time looking at their odalis. Um, and you can see, you know, this one looks particularly good, which is always a running joke for people who look at odalisks because we always pick the best odalisks to show. Uh, and so what those data showed is, and this is just basically density or the number, um, the winter again in this greeny blue color, summer in the gold, you can see that this is standard length. This is simply the size of the fish, but these winter fish were generally smaller both winters compared to both summers. They were also not as, their bodies were not as deep and they were also significantly younger. So this is age again from the otolus. This is, um, these are a couple plots of the otolus data, the growth data to give you a sense from Newport on the left, Trinidad head on the right. The top two panels are, um, basically mean growth, that increment width uh, for every day of life um, of those larval fishes. And you can see that in all cases here, um, the two winter cruises, the fish are growing significantly um, slower than the fish from the summer cruises. And as a consequence, if we look at the size at age, how big were these fish at a given age, you can see that they were much smaller. And when she looked at the recent growth, the growth right before collection, it was consistent with that. These winter fish growing more slowly than the summer fish. Why might that be? Well, Kelsey also looked at gut contents and I've simplified her results quite a bit here. Um, just just uh, talk about biomass and not numbers. But if we look at the winter fish, they're primarily eating our burrs, the nauplii, these, this red color here, whereas the summer fish are eating a higher proportion of calanoid copepods. Now these summer fish were divided into small and large just to look at how that diet changes with size. And you can see as the fish get larger and larger, they're eating more uh, copepods. I'm not gonna um, go into detail about these modeling um, results, but you can look at them if you're interested. But the take home message here is that the highest growth of this you know, rather ubiquitous species occurs during intermediate upwelling um, when there's actually rather warm water temperatures and low nauplii and high abundances of calanoids. And I'm not gonna get into it any more than that, because soon you will be able to hear much, much more about it. Kelsey is about to defend her PhD on May 6th, so please turn in, tune in for that. 
She's not only going to be talking about lanternfish, she's also going to be talking about anchovies, the Columbia River, and crab zoea. So be sure to keep an eye out for that. <clears throat> okay, I see I'm starting to run out of time. I'm going to have to pick up a little bit here. But now we're going to turn to some of the, the last two tales will be based on data from the Smurf program. Juveniles that are collected as they're coming in at the end of their time at sea, they're coming in to settle to this nearshore environment. So Will Fenny, who graduated, how long ago was it now, Will? Um, a year ago plus, um, <clears throat> looked at seven years worth of um, collection data from the Smurfs. Now these plots here are basically talking about um, the environmental conditions out here. We know that uh, environmental conditions in the Northern California current are highly variable. This top plot, just this is only three of those indices. Just as an example, this is the relative um, proportion of copa, the copepod biomass of the southern species. And you can see that that fluctuates over the seven year period. We can see that sea surface temperature goes up and down with the year, of course, I mean, within a year, of course, uh, seasonally. But it also does, if you look at the low lows here and the high highs, there is change um, happening across uh, this seven year period. And likewise, this indices of upwelling changing over time. Again, I'm not going into all the different indices we have out here, just to make the point that there's a lot of variation. Now for this um, tale, we'll focus on uh, the black rockfish. And he was able to take these fish collected in the Smurf, look at their otoliths and figure out when they experience the conditions offshore. And that's what these gray boxes indicate. He also could compute the total settlement abundance each year. And you can see that that also fluctuates. This is simply the number of fish in that Smurf every uh, couple of weeks. And you can see that there were years, 2015, when the numbers were very low, in contrast to 2019, when um, there was much higher uh, settlement. In addition, and not only um, you know, can he figure some of that out using otolith microstructure, but that provides a lot of information on, <clears throat> on other early life history traits. And what I mean by that is, for example, the top here is the birth date um, that each of these groups of fish uh, were born. And you can see lots of variation there. The mean growth rate also up and down. Some years not as, as variable, other years quite uh, from year to year quite variable. This is almost a mirror image, the um, age at settlement. So how long basically fish spent at sea and then size at settlement, which typically is a function of, of both the growth rate and the number of days that they were growing at that rate. Um, you can see that the size at which they entered this juvenile, uh, nearshore juvenile habitat was also quite variable. Just to illustrate that, um, circled in the purple here, you can see in 2013, fish were growing very slowly. Um, as a result, they spent a long time at sea and they settled at rather large sizes. This is in contrast to 2015, where fish were growing very quickly, very rapidly settled fast, so they were very young at the time they settled, and as a result of only being out there, uh, you know, a relatively short, num a few number of days, they were rather small at the time they settled. So these traits can tell us a lot about how those fish um, both have survived as well as what their likelihood is of surviving this next phase. Now, this next bit is a little more complicated, but I've uh, grossly simplified it. And uh, we'll also looked at that rate of settlement to see how that was related to, or if it was related to growth rate. And this is mean larval growth across the bottom. And in general, roughly, uh, increasing water temperature this way as well. And so just rather simply, what we see here is that um, the, the settlement rate actually peaks um, at intermediate growth rates. And um, you know, we think that's the, the case because 
growth tends to increase uh, with increasing temperature up to a certain point here. So and that's because uh, you know fish are cold, cold blooded, so to speak, and their metabolism depends on the water that they're in. But at some point, they're simply as water temperatures get warmer and warmer and warmer, that growth rate would tend to be much higher. Well, and it is, however, um, there simply was, are at times just insufficient prey to sustain that high growth. So these survivors were those that were able to find enough prey and, and reach that um, juvenile habitat. But because there often just was not enough prey available during those years, there just weren't enough, not, there were not as many that made it back uh, to settle. So that's the hypothesis based on that work. I'm gonna to have to talk even faster now as we get to the very last, very last um, story or tale here. And this is Megan Wilson's work. Um, and that's same system, same sampling unit. This is a Smurf in, uh, in situ, so to speak. And, but instead she's focused on cabazon. Many of you who fish will recognize cabazon on the left here, but the stage that we are more interested in is actually uh, this one over here. This particular one has actually made the transition uh, from the silvery um, fish out at sea to this nearshore um, juvenile. So instead of um, looking at fish over each year, like Will did for the black rock fish, cabazon is really interesting in that it settles throughout the, the season in which the Smurfs are deployed. And Megan um, was able to look at five years of data here and divide those fishes from each year into an early, a mid, and a late cohort. Fish is settling at different times during each summer. And ask the question, you know, how, how do those fish vary from one another and which one is more successful? She plotted here settlement rate. Sue, if you can hear us, we lost your audio. Now, um, Sue, can yes. you hear me now? Yes. So we lost your audio there for a little bit. Oh dear me, my goodness, you're getting a whole slew of fun games tonight. So where did you lose me? Uh, the last slide. Okay. You were just talking about that graph. Okay. And I think you were just finishing that and moving to the next thing. And we okay, just... yeah, my, my only point here, and sorry to, to lose you all, or I guess you lost me, <laughs> um, lots of variation, interannually and within year as well. Now, Megan also looked at other aspects, especially growth, as I hope you're realizing growth is one of those things we're very interested in. And basically for each of the five years here, 2013, 15, 16, 18, and 19, and these are growth of each of these um, late in the green, mid in the blue, and early cohorts um, in purple. And you can see that the late cohort has the fastest growth. The green line here basically is above all the other lines every year. And this results in a significantly larger uh, fish at a given age as well. The green line again and the size plots are all above the other two. Just really briefly here, also some of these early life history traits such as how old the fish were at the time they settled, lots of variation uh, within and among years and then size at settlement as well. In some cases, there's not as much variation, say in 2015 among these three cohorts, but in 2016, um, these late settling fish were significantly smaller uh, than the others. <clears throat> so here, um, looking at uh, settlement rate here with uh, mean growth rate, instead of seeing that dome relationship, that um, Will Fenny found, Megan sees more of a, of, a, of a decrease here where it's these slow growing early cohorts that actually exhibit the higher recruitment or higher settlement depending on what terminology you wanna use. 
But this story's not over yet. Megan is still in progress working up these data and she's examining the prey that these fish are eating as well as the prey that are available. So do stay tuned for the next exciting installment of that story. So I'm gonna wrap up now and I know I'm way over time um, with all these glitches here. Just a couple take home messages. I hope you've seen that uh, fish larvae are not all alike and that they vary in their growth related um, early life history traits. I'm gonna try plugging back into my monitor here and see what chaos that ensues. <laughs> okay, I don't know if you can see me any better now. We can't see you, but we can still see the slide. So okay. doing okay. Okay. Lots of different fish coming in uh, from their comp, comp during this complex life history, settling to the environment with different traits. What's really important to them is the temperature they experience as well as the prey availability. Predators are also important, but I did not have time to talk about that today. Larval growth it is a central process and can influence the number of fish settling or recruiting into the population. And I hope you've also seen that by quantifying sort of the natural environment, um, the planktonic environment basically that's relevant to larval fish helps us understand the processes that are important to those fish. And that finally combining these central tools that we use in different ways really allows us to peer into the life of these larval uh, fishes in the plankton. And I'll just have a couple wind up Hello, now I lost my monitor again, my goodness. Anyway, a couple wind up uh, stories. Can you still see my- We can still see this. Slide. Okay. Just a quick acknowledgement of our funding and that it really does take a uh, team to make all this happen. And I have three final how to get involved comments. One, you can sign up and um, you know like the Hat Hatfield uh, Facebook page and get updates. On our, fall, on our upcoming cruises, one of which leaves very soon. Um, you can visit planktonportal.org, which is our citizen science outreach, and learn to identify some of this wonky, crazy critters that we see in our imaging system. So you can actually participate in classifying real data, or you can actually get your hands wet, so to speak, and uh, volunteer to sort plankton samples. Feel free to contact any of us about any of that. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, there are lots of questions in the chat. And so I just wanna start out by saying, if anybody needs to leave at seven o'clock, feel free to drop off um, whenever it makes Me sense too. to you. <laughs> and Sue, I was gonna ask, are you willing to stay on for just a little bit so we can work yes. through some of these questions? All right. Yes. And, and I'm also we, gonna say one thing, and that yeah, is hopefully please. all of these uh, main architects of these tales are online and will answer some of the questions. <laughs> Great. So for uh, any of the Plankton Lab students, if you see a question directly related to any of your work, if you wanna answer it in the chat to everybody, that would be great. Um, okay, so I'm just going to start working through some of these. For folks, if I don't get to your question or I skip it because it's a little more complicated, um, yeah, please feel free to reach out to the Plankton Lab. You can find them um, on the HMSC website under research under Plankton Lab, um, and you will find information there. Okay, so Sue, the first question that came up, um, these first two are about ices. Um, okay. Can you talk to us about how ISIS maintains undisturbed water column as it's being towed through the water? Yeah, so it is less undisturbed when it's <laughs> thrown into the water and you know at the surface and all that. There's certainly tons of bubbles and we can see those bubbles in the images and we can see all that happening. Um, it becomes less disturbed as it gets down below the wake of the boat and is sampling um, pretty undisturbed water. So it's designed in a way that the water moves around those pods and, and we know um, that it's undisturbed based on some of the behavior of the organisms and their, their um, tentacles and the way they're oriented. And um, so it's not always undisturbed, but we're careful about which data we actually look at. 
Great. And you addressed this a little bit in one of your last slides, but an early question asked, um, are the images captured by ISIS system publicly available? They'd make wonderful data for training an artificial neural network for imaging recognition, which I know you can speak to. Yeah. In fact, if I don't know if Mo's here, but he might, he could speak to some of that, but um, they are publicly available, not instantaneously, although we're working on having it more and more instantaneous. They are publicly, there is um, a, a set of data, more than one set actually, that, that is available on Plankton uh, portal. And those are real data that you know, we've collected on these cruises. The other data are um, eventually available. It just, um, <laughs> there are, there's so, so much that finding a way to make them available can be very challenging. Um, but yes, we are creating, for example, also a global library of plankton imaging. And we'll have all the images and all these, um, you know, from all different oceans on it. And that's a, actually a broader collaboration with our, some international colleagues as well. So yes, the short answer is yes. I should have just said yes. <laughs> Great. Um... And then these next three questions are all about the Florida data set, I believe. Um, is there a possible reason for the shift in copepod nopula life stages in 2014 to 2015? Or was that data collected over different seasons? The data, well, um, I'm not quite sure. They were all collected at the same time of year each year. Okay. So yes, there's likely underlying reasons why there were um, and, and our study can't really comment too much on that. We can look at the long-term, you know, leading up to the cruise, what were water temperatures like and, and so forth and so on. Um, but at this juncture, it, that's a little bit outside the scope of what we were trying to do. We were trying to really understand the relationship between the prey environment and the predator environment actually um, with the growth of the fish um, and not necessarily the cause of the changes in the prey and predator environment, if that makes sense. And I don't know if Miriam's here, but she can certainly uh, jump in on that. Great. Um, were there caloric measurements in comparison of the plankton the larval fish were feeding on? This one's referring to the um, black tuna scenario in Florida. <laughs> well, the samples were collected for that, but no. Short answer, no. <laughs> 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 Sounds like maybe work to come, but not at well, this Well, sample preservation problem. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, why in Florida is temperature so important, Florida and Cuba? Is it upwelling like it is on our coast? So there is upwelling. Yeah, there is some. And there's also upwelling associated with, and I sometimes have talked about this, but I didn't this time, with large scale eddies that circulate and move along that frontal boundary with the Florida current. So because it's so dynamic and because of the way that it whips around the Florida peninsula, you get these um, cyclonic eddies that actually have upwelling in the middle of them so that there is an element of upwelling and, and along, the, along the coast as well. Nice. And uh, for folks that ask questions, I know on my chat, it's a little hard to keep track of everything's at, but there are some answers coming in. So if you're looking for an answer to one of your questions, it might've already come in. Um, and then we'll see if I can keep up with things. Um, could, I mean, you kind of talked about this a little bit, and um, but could differential environmental factors influence otolith growth rather than being a signal for age? Yeah, that's, that's something that people have explored quite a bit. And we do a number of things before it's, it's, I always refer to it as like our housekeeping. And that is we sort of, we check the relationships between otolith growth and, and body size and sort of even, um, well, actually it actually, it actually happened in this, in, in Miriam's case, it happened that year where the old lith deposition rate was different in 2015 than it was in 2014. And so we actually could not use old lith increment weight uh, mm -hmm. widths. And she had to instead use somatic growth, which is just looking at, you know, how big the fish was and how old it was. And, uh, and that was likely because when sometimes growth is so slow, 
um, there's a decoupling in that relationship between otolith growth mm -hmm. and somatic growth. Mm -hmm. So yes, there can be other reasons, um, but within, if you're careful and conservative, you can still uh, use, use the information in certain ways. Um, I'm going to jump just a little bit because this question is slightly related, but what are the consequences to an organism having a younger settlement age versus having an older settlement age? What does this mean for the species? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. It's super important. Um, how can I il illustrate this? So while um, we basically think that, you know, while the fish is at sea, there are a lot of mouths out there trying to consume it. It's a difficult world to earn a living. Um, and the sooner you can move out of that world and enter the next world that you're occupying, the greater the likelihood of survivorship. So if you think of that mortality curve that I showed in the very beginning, if we think about the, the odds of surviving every day are really low for a young fish and a little bit higher higher survivorship for an older fish. And if you can um, basically grow fast and the faster you grow, you will not fit in as many mouths as you might have if you were smaller. And you basically leave that treacherous environment out there in the ocean and get down to a more two-dimensional environment, slightly more two-dimensional. Uh, so basically uh, your odds Generally speaking, what we think is if you can shorten that amount of time and still be developed and big and so forth, um, you'll have higher survivorship. We should see higher recruit, higher settlement, higher recruitment thing to get out of the water column fast. But the, the trade-off is that by leaving the water column quickly, sometimes you're you're small. And if you you're small and you enter that enter your next environment, you're likely be um, susceptible to more predation. So it's a bit of a trade-off. Um, there are some really interesting conversations happening in chat. Um, one of them is related to whether ISIS could be flown as an AUV uh, uh, remotely operated vehicle to get away from the wake. Um, okay. And it- um, It can't be now, but- <laughs> But Bob Cowan and, and others have been in conversation about developing that um, to be able to put it on a glider. Great. So um, for folks that are online and you want to follow up, I think that uh, the individuals that you've been chatting with are the right contacts for you. Um, but if not, you can contact the generic, the generic contact at the Plankton Lab or reach out to me or reach out to Sue, um, and we'll make sure that you get the information you need. We have kept you for a while longer. I thank you so much all for being here. I know it's really hard to give up some of your evening time um, to spend time learning about all this great science, but we thank you so much for being here. And Sue, thank you so much for uh, spending your time with us and navigating some technical challenges yeah, and staying right on track. So I think I for apologize that. for those technical glitches, but it's the way of the world. And, and I want to just thank my team members who are doing so well answering all these questions. <laughs> Thanks, Agreed. It takes a team to answer these complex questions. So thank you so much for everybody online. Again, thank you so much for being here. We hope to see you next month when um, Peter comes to talk to us about coastal resilience. And again, Sue, thank you so much. All right, everybody, until Thanks, next everybody. time. Thank you. You're getting lots of claps in the chat, by the way. Uh, <laughs> virtual uh, happiness happening down there. So anyway, uh, thank you again, everybody. And uh, thank you for those that participated. And we'll talk to you again next month. Bye now. Ciao.